thanks for that. Okay, yeah. So I'm just going to talk briefly about shorebirds and just some of the uh, great, the great things about them and the amazing. Firstly, the amazing journeys they take. So why is that not going? There we go. Yeah. So not, a lot of the shorebirds that we have in Australia. Um, I'll get to some of the different species in a minute, but we share. Yeah, we, I guess we share custody and we share responsibility of the migratory shorebirds from the East Asian Australian flyway. So a lot of the birds we see here on our shores in the summertime will spend our winter in the north up around sort of Russia and northern China and Siberia. Um, pretty much all the species except for one species, the double barred plover, double banded plover, sorry, that migrates between New Zealand and Australia. So this flyway is, um, it's, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's super important for all these birds. And so every stop off along the way has a responsibility to everyone else along that flyway to um, look after what's there. So, so what is there? So shorebirds, it's a pretty broad, a pretty broad term. Uh, we use to describe about 210 species of birds that typically inhabit sort of pretty pretty shallow waters and mud flats in intertidal zones, but also um, uh, freshwater lakes. So we have 54 species in Australia. Uh, 17 of them are residents. So that means they'll stay here all, all year. They might move around a bit up and down the coast or uh, find new, new grounds when they've um, fledged. So it's sort of be, find new breeding territory. But the remainder of that 54 species, they migrate to some degree along the East Asian Australian flyway. And so these journeys, there are, they're pretty, pretty immense journeys. They're not all done in, um, oh, I might just go back that slide, sorry. So this, this shorebird here, this is, is the largest of all the shorebirds in Australia. It's the Far Eastern Curlew. It's about 40 centimetres high and you'll, they're fairly common. You'll see them at Harrington and at Old Bar and, uh, down around Newcastle, sort of, they're pretty, they stand out from their huge beak. There's nothing else really with a beak that big. And so that's, um, yeah, next time you're down in the intertidal zone, have a look and you might see them, see them hanging around. So they have a pretty, pretty good journey. They spend like our southern summer in Australia and I think New Zealand, but anyway, we'll focus on Australia for now. And then they migrate north and around March and they'll stop off around the sort of uh, Yellow Sea area and then up to their breeding grounds. And so that sort of that stop off there and that so there's three three homes essentially that they have along the way. So there's three separate places in the world that sort of can threaten them. Uh, so shorebirds I think on a whole it's pretty safe to say they're, they're declining different species at different rates. And because of this, one of the reasons is because they have so many places that they need to be kept pristine. It's not one house to look after, it's three. So yeah, this is a pretty big journey, but a bigger journey still is the bar-tailed godwit. So these birds also fairly common. Uh, I think they're less numbers than they used to be, but they're a pretty common bird. Again, uh, if you take note of its beak or bill, it's sort of curved upwards a little bit. That's pretty, pretty distinctive of the species. Uh, there's a couple of other species of godswit that are pretty similar, but here in the East Coast, uh, bar-tailed godwit's the most common. So they actually have the longest uh, migratory, uh, single, single migration of any bird. Uh, so the previous record was about 11,000 kilometers in one trip, but this year it was smashed by 2,000 kilometers. So 13,000 kilometers, I think, is the current record for a bird flying nonstop from, from taking off in around Alaska and flying back to, in the case of the record breaker, it was New Zealand. Uh, so we know this because a research team in New Zealand have done some, done some uh, banding and, and putting some radio trackers on birds. So I'll focus on this one particular bird because it happened to land here in the Manning Valley uh, a couple of months ago, and it has since actually made its way back home. So it's done the full circle. So last year, 
in New Zealand, they banded this bird and tracked its flight and it stopped off here in the Yellow Sea and then went up to Siberia to its breeding grounds. I don't know if it bred. I don't know, I don't know that they can really tell that, but yeah, had a bit of a fly around there. And then from this YK Delta flew nonstop to Manning Point, which, and then I saw it down at Farquhar. So this is that bird there. You can see the uh, radio tracker hanging off the back of it, the little antenna. And they use um, color bands on birds' legs quite often. And so this color banding with that particular bird, you know, it's that exact bird. So the color band is a code essentially that anyone can use to tell. So that bird now has made its way home and it's one of several birds tracked by this research team that's helping sort of shed light on where these birds go because, I, well, I mean, in early days, they had no idea where birds went. They just disappeared for, the, for a season and then they'd come back. But now we're sort of getting a pretty good handle on where they go. And this, this migration, it's, it's pretty huge and it, they have some pretty unique adaptations to make that, make that possible. So they put on, they pretty much double their body weight. And so they look like little footballs apparently when they take off and they, they have some pretty unique abilities to sort of metabolize different, um, they can metabolize fat into energy and they just burn that fat as they're flying. And they just keep flying the whole way. They're not really soaring. They're pretty much flapping the entire way. So it took about eight days for this, this particular bird to fly from here to here at about, I think at an average of about 50 kilometers an hour. So it's pretty, I mean, it's a pretty impressive migration and there's thousands of these birds that do these migration every year and um, sort of variations on a theme with different species. So I'll just talk a little bit about where they live so here this is Farquhar Inlet it kind of looks a bit like a desert however it's not I mean it's a desert at first glance but in the last 18 months I've counted over 25 species of shorebirds there and there's definitely some that I've missed and there's definitely some that I haven't been able to identify not because they're new just because I haven't been able to um, so this the way the way they can live there and they sort of live pretty happily. If um, you have a look again at their beaks, they're all pretty different. So they, they managed to break up this seemingly similar ecosystem into, into small parts that they can all have a piece of. So this next slide, the real key to a lot of their um, dividing that ecosystem or that area amongst themselves is their beaks. So their beaks are, pretty remarkable in size and shape and they're all quite differently sized and shaped so if you look so the eastern curlew with the longest beak of all it can dig down really deep into the sand and they also have some little nerve endings in the end of their beak so they can feel stuff moving and they can actually move their beak a little bit to grab stuff in the sand so it's these they're not seeing what they're um, feeding on down there they're um they're feeling it down there and they can, they can feel around for food like that. Bar-tailed godwit's similar, but again, it's a different depth. So you've already got some, some separation in space there. Uh, the pied oyster catcher, which were a pretty common bird on our beaches here, the black and white with a big red beak, probably should have included a picture of that actually. Uh, they've got a big strong beak for crushing up shells. They can crush up pippies. People often see them up on the, on the way, like the shore where there's sort of a pretty decent wave action and they might find pippies and crush them up. And then we'll go to the other end of this diagram and we've got the birds with the smaller beaks, so plovers. And if you notice, they've got quite big eyes. So these guys are visual feeders. So they're feeding off stuff on the surface. Uh, and we've got a ruddy turnstone here. So in that, its sort of name gives it away a little bit. It'll, it, you'll see that on the sort of pebbly beaches uh, and it'll be flipping over stones, picking up stuff under the stones. And then if we go to the left here, we've got sort of a beach stone curlew. There's, um, there's one of them in the Manning Valley and they've got a big strong beak, pretty good for crushing up crabs and, and other shells. And this again is the godwit with its um, nice fine, fine beak for digging down nice and deep to get those invertebrates. And then this little guy down the bottom, these is a spoon-billed sandpiper. They're not 
I, I don't think they've ever been found in Australia, but I thought it'd be good to include because of its sort of novelty shaped beak, much like the uh, spoonbills that we get in Australia, but much smaller and they will feed in a similar manner, actually sort of digging, filtering around in the really shallow water and, and sandy areas. These guys are actually critically endangered. I think there's about 350 or something left. So it'd be, um, I'd be pretty lucky to see one here, I think. Um, yeah, so the main thing I really wanted to cover was the feeding diversity. So what seems to be like a, a similar environment, there's actually quite a lot going on. So a sand flat might look at first glance like just a vast expanse of nothing but these birds can, um, they can really make enough, something out of it to the extent where they can feed up enough and put on enough weight to fly for 11,000 kilometers in one, in one go. So, I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of little ghost shrimps or little worms. Um, so some more foods, it's basically any, any little invertebrate that you'll get on a beach. Um, a lot of them probably a bit too small for us to see with our naked eye. Um, yeah, so there's actually quite a lot going on in that sand. So I'll just quickly focus on, um, cause I'm just conscious of time, but we have some beach nesting birds as well. So it's not just feeding that birds can do on the beach. They, um, they can lay their eggs. So the little terns here all along the East coast is quite a few turn colonies. The Manning has, been on and off one of, or it is still one of the most important colonies in the state and they'll lay their eggs in um pretty small little scrapes on the sand so if you look on the picture on the left it's just two eggs uh it's just it's almost like someone scraped it out with its with it with their hand and they'll lay um between one and three eggs on the beach and they the little turns will lay in a bit of a colony it's not it's not strictly a colony, but they'll have a bit of a loose aggregation of birds and that gives them some sort of safety in numbers. So if a predator comes along, they'll, they'll sort of fly up off the nest and make a bit of a racket, which is not so good for land predators like dogs and foxes because it's, it's, um, they just they cause quite a bit of damage. But they still, um, they've still succeeded for millions of years nesting on beaches. So they've got, um, they've got something going right and uh, they'll uh, incubate the eggs for about 17 days or 18 days and then the chicks will hatch and just yeah these chicks in this picture here would be that'd be about their first day maybe their second day of life and then they're at the adults feed them pretty much flat out for another three weeks and then they will fledge and then they can fly and then they'll typically fly back to sort of southeast asia is where the little turns come from um, but if you just i'll just go back a slide so if you look this bird is feeding its young whole pilchards or like whole white bait and that that so they pretty much feed them whole fish from the day they're born so they get pretty much force fed really they grow super fast and then they can fly from three weeks so that's i think it's pretty important to be able to get off the ground if you're going to live in a place like that so they're pretty pretty vulnerable to inundation from high tides or storms and as I said foxes and avian predators and also humans I mean you can hardly see those nests so you can step on them pretty easy and and four-wheel drives you definitely can't see them when you're driving so that's why we have in the colonies in the Manning we fence off areas to just try and direct people around the nest area to try and give try and give everyone a bit of the beach to use really it's the goal um, try and share the shore so just uh, just one more beach nesting bird that also nests here in the Manning is the pied oyster catcher. And these are eggs about as big as a chook egg and just a lot more colorful. And they nest a little bit higher in the, in the sand, a little bit just to, when there's just enough sort of spin effects and a little bit of cover for the chicks to hide in. So they sort of hide, that's their defense. If they see you coming, they'll run off and hide. So if you don't, if you're trying to find them and count them, you got to be pretty quick because if they see you before you see them, you probably won't find them that day. Um, but here's a yeah, the, these ones are not too scared. I was drifting past in a boat, and so these guys, they actually disappeared from their nest for about two weeks, and then I found them again the other day. So that was pretty.
pretty good. They've fledged this year in the Manning. So that's that's been um, a bit of good news in a pretty mixed year so far. So it's just, um, yeah, I think it's important to think about what actually can inhabit the beach when you're, when you're um, walking on the beach or driving on the beach or whatever you do. And uh, as I said, they're pretty hard to see. So I don't know if anyone can see the nests there. But yeah, just um, just need to sort of watch your step when you're on the beach and yeah, enjoy it really. And just, yeah, wonder at the some of the animals that live on there and maybe try and pick out a few shorebird uh, species if you can. Anyway, thank you. I think I'm awesome. just under time. Yeah, fabulous. Good going, Silas. Thank you so much.